All right, so before we start, um, we first acknowledge the country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, the East Port New South Wales Student and Early Career Researcher Chapter and the East Port Victoria and the Tasmania Student Chapter acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. Okay, so again, welcome everyone to the um, second eSports Student Symposium for, for Australia. So this is the um, eSports Student Symposium 2022. I am John Paul Cesar de los Trinos, the co-chair of the organizing committee, the immediate past president of the eSports New South Wales Student and ECR chapter, and also a PhD student at the Kirby Institute Fund at the University of New South Wales. Okay, so people are arriving. Um, yeah, and we are pleased to welcome everyone here. And I think we'll, um, there will be more participants to join us um, later on. So maybe I could just um, ask also Anne Nguyen if, um, to check, um, just to ensure that we actually, that, that we actually have like the right Zoom link um, in the calendar. I'm just um, maybe like, oh no, they're actually here. They're joining now. All right. So again, we welcome you to the Esports Student Symposium Australia. And this year's theme is Building Excellence in Health Economics and Outcomes Research. And now in, on its second year, this symposium, this symposium is an annual event where students and early career researchers in Australia can meet and are provided with the opportunity to interchange ideas their latest research experiences, and also to connect with colleagues in health and econom health economics and outcomes research. So we have prepared an excellent night up of research speakers for this symposium. Okay. So first we actually have the keynotes. We are very lucky and we are very fortunate to have Professor Richard Cookson of York Center for Health Economics. So he will be, um, he will, um, he will have a recorded presentation that we will share or present today. And then to provide more insights on that presentation on distribution cost effective analysis and equity in economic analysis, we also have Professor um, Steven Yan of George Institute for Global Health to discuss its implications in, in contextualize it in the Australian setting. And then after that, we'll have the research spotlight where five students and early career researchers will present their latest health and economic outcomes research. And then that will be followed by an interview with Prof, uh, Professor Rosa Viney, a leading HER academic to discuss the benefits and challenges of academic research and to understand more broadly about their passion in research. And then later on, we will have parallel sessions and then followed by parallel interactive sessions to be followed by a networking um, session. And so this year's symposium, before we start, I just have to um, introduce um, the organizers um, for this year's event. So this year's symposium is jointly hosted by the Eastport Victoria and Tasmania Student Chapter and the Eastport Sydney Student and ECR Chapter. And also would like um, the Eastport New South Wales uh, Chapter is um, officially endorsed in July 2020 and provides opportunities for professional development and a platform for knowledge exchange and networking for students and ECRs in health economics and outcomes research. So we are composed of students and ECRs from six universities across New South Wales. While the Esports Victoria Tasmania chapter is also part of the Esports and Esports Student Network and is a collaboration between University of Melbourne, Monash University, Deakin University and the University of Tasmania. And I also want to acknowledge the symposium planning committee, which is presented in my, um, which is, I am currently sharing now. Also, um, thank you very much to my co-chair, Tan Nguyen from Deakin University, and also Marty, uh, Martin Wu is actually not here, but he is uh, very um, instrumental in organizing um, this event. And just for some house rules, so again, they, all of the sessions will be recorded and will be shared later on um, to, the, to, the, to those who registered. Requesting everyone to please mute yourselves and turn off video when you are not presenting. And let us um, wait for the chair's instructions on when the questions could be asked for each presentation. 
And then um, for the program details, you could see all of the Zoom links and make the program in the calendar invitation that we have sent to you. All right. So now um, we'll proceed to the, sorry. We'll now proceed to the keynote um, presentation. Okay. So again, for our keynote presentation, we are lucky to have a presentation from Professor Richard Cookson, Professor and Co-Director of the Equity and Health Policy Research Group at the University of York. So his um, research focuses on equity in healthcare and healthcare. He has helped to develop local health equity indicators for the National Health Service, equity informative health economic evaluation, and methods for gauging public concern for reducing health inequality. Richard edited the Oxford University Press Handbook of Distribution and Cost Effectiveness Analysis, which was recently published, and co-founded special interest groups on this topic for the International Health Economics Association and the International Society for Pharmacoeconomics and Outcomes Research. Okay, so I will now share his um, presentation, which will then be followed by um, the discussion by our discussion for today. Okay. Can I just confirm that we could all see um, the video? Yes, yes we, we can. can. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, I'm Richard Cookson from the University of York, and I'll be talking about using distributional cost effectiveness analysis to help reduce health inequality. Um, thanks so much to Paul and Eleanor from the Isborne New South Wales student chapters uh, for inviting me and um, to uh, Stephen Yang for agreeing to discuss me. I really appreciate uh, you, you doing all that and um, I'm really sorry I can't be there uh, live. It's just a completely wrong time of night for me. Apologies, I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. Um, but anyway, I hope this kicks off a good discussion, and I'm sure it will with Stephen and the others uh, around the place to, to guide the discussion. So um, all the best to you all, and I uh, hope, hope this, this uh, talk of mine gives some, at least kickstarts a discussion, put it that way. Currently, decision makers in the health sector see the world a bit like this. They see averages, the white light of averages average costs, average effects, average performance data. Um, this is a problem if you're interested in reducing health inequality. You need to see the world like this. You need to see the distributions of who gains and who loses, who bears the costs, who, who gains the benefits of decisions. Um, and the whole point of distributional cost effectiveness analysis is to split that white light of averages into uh, the rainbow of distributions so that so that we know who gains and who loses from decisions and we can think about the trade-offs that sometimes arise between maximizing health increasing average outcomes and reducing the distribution reducing the inequality in outcomes so um a crucial aspect of distributional analysis is that it's not just about describing problems. Um, the history of health services research in many ways, certainly of health economics, is of moving away from just describing things to evaluating, you know, describing problems to evaluating solutions. So classically in the old days, people thought that economic health economics was all about cost of illness studies or burden of disease studies. Um, Yes, it is about that, but it's about a lot more than that. If you want to actually reduce uh, illness and reduce the burden of illness, reduce the cost of illness, you need to know the effects, the impacts of your decisions on those burdens. So you need, you know, you need information about the impact of an intervention on the cost of illness, the impact uh, of an intervention on the burden of illness. And guess what? The same is true for health inequality. It's no good just describing you know, how awful things are, the health inequalities, I mean, they are awful, there are terrible inequalities out there, but you need to also show what the effect is of your decision on reducing or indeed increasing those inequalities. That's what's useful 
actually for decision makers. So that's the purpose of distributional cost effectiveness analysis. So here's a, a nice illustration uh, of health inequalities. And the point is not just to describe that imbalance, but to describe how it is shifted by making decisions by your intervention. How do we change the balance of, it, of health inequality in society when we make a decision? Do we, do we, do we, do we make things worse? Do we make things better? And by how much? And the how much question is very important in economics, in decision making. You need to know, it's not just enough to know the direction of an impact, you need to know the size of an impact. Um, so what do we mean by health inequality? What does that actually mean? Well, we, I, I'm just going to take the standard definition from the World Health Organization, which is that it's unfair differences in health between more and less socially disadvantaged groups. Uh, and the World Health Organization calls those health inequities. Uh, in the USA, they are often called health disparities. Uh, in my own country, in England, we call them health inequalities. You know, whatever, you can call them what you want. But basically, they're unfair differences in health between more and less socially disadvantaged groups. Uh, there is a fairness aspect to it. Um, you know, mathematicians use the word inequality just to mean a pure difference without any ethical connotation. Um, most of us, certainly um, philosophers and um, epidemiologists and so on, tend to use the word in inequality uh, with, a, with a kind of moral ethical angle. Um, yeah, so that's a bit of terminology. Now, how do you measure it? Well, you know, here's an example of a specific inequality measure would be differences in cancer survival rates between social groups. Um, that's fine. It could be useful information. But if you want to you know, have comparisons between disease areas of the size of an, of an impact, you really need a generic health inequality measure, just in the same way that we use qualies and dallies. Uh, to have a generic summary measure of, of, of health for comparing between disease areas and interventions. We need the same thing for health inequality. So, for example, differences in quality adjusted life expectancy at birth uh, between social groups would be, you know, a, a, a generic measure of health inequality and you know, lifetime quality impact. Um, and Alongside the generic measure, lifetime qualities, you also need a, a generic social disadvantage grouping. You need the same set of social groups each time you do the analysis so that you can make comparisons. Um, so in England, we often use five quintile groups of neighbourhoods based on a thing called the index of multiple deprivation. It's a postcode, postcode based index with various elements, income, employment, disability, education, crime, housing, living environment, so on. Various in, uh, indicators of social disadvantage sort of mushed together to produce an overall. Um, and that turns out to be useful in the English and Welsh context just because we have the, you know, these, the, 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 this data and it's linked to, to health data. So that's a useful way of doing it. Um, and in the United States, I've been doing some work recently with, with colleagues and they've chosen to use 15 social groups because yes there are these quintile groups um, of deprivation which which they they use to think of a social vulnerability index which is very much like the imd in england um, but also race and ethnicity is really important in the united states so they've split it by by um you know white um non-hispanic hispanic and, and black non-hispanic groups um, three major ethnic groups where there's important justice concerns in Australia, um, obviously it's up to Australians how you split your data and what's what the equity relevant groups are. But I would imagine indigeneity, indigenous status would be um, one crucial aspect. And perhaps, you know, you could also use five quintile groups using one of your socioeconomic indices for areas. Um, and, the, and the point is, nothing is perfect here. And if you if you want a tractable generic analysis, you're going to have to have a fairly small number of social groups. And you're never going to capture every single aspect of social disadvantage using that grouping. You know, there will be imperfections and, and blind spots, but it can be used as a sort of general measure and a starting point for looking also at more specific inequalities. Um, OK. Another sort of basic introductory point to make that's very important is that 
there are many ways of thinking about health justice and many different concerns for fairness. And health inequality is an important concern, but it's not the only one. You know, there are many equity concerns out there. Health inequality is just one of them. So um, the way that health inequality sits in this picture is kind of in the middle here. This is, it actually is part of the value maximizing way of thinking. You're, you're, you're trying to, um, you know, the healthy, health, health economic analysis tends to be about maximizing health or benefit, so some total of benefits. Well, health inequality tends to be about minimizing unfair inequality. Um, so it's about, um, you know, it's, it's in that generic value maximizing way of thinking, although it's a minimizing principle. Um, and you can put those two things together nicely by talking about equity weighted social value. Um, now that's fine, that's a nice, it's called consequentialist way of thinking about the world and it's perfectly respectable and so on, but there are plenty of other ethical frameworks and ways of thinking um, that, that one wants to take into account when making priority setting decisions. So there are plenty of moral rights, this is a, a different way of thinking about justice, so you might have a right to autonomy as a patient, you might have a right to be treated with dignity and a right to non-discrimination and so on and so forth. And these rights may conflict or at least be different from these, these you know, minimizing health inequality or maximizing health. Um, on the left hand side, we've got the fair shares way of thinking. There's another strong way of thinking about justice, which is that you should get a fair share of resources in proportion to your needs. Um, and again, because that's about proportionality, um, that can also conflict with a maximizing way of thinking. Um, and finally, at the bottom, we've got the fair processes way of thinking about justice, that you should have a process that's impartial, accountable, inclusive, and so on and so forth. And as ever, um, there can be conflicts. You know, the, 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 the process might not, a you know, fair process might not yield a value maximizing outcome and, and so on. So um, it's just a different way of thinking about justice, perfectly legitimate to insist on these additional uh, fairness criteria. Um, okay. Now, um, following on from that, crucially, there are two very different notions of equity that can conflict, and it's quite important to understand that they're different. So health inequality is, is about, um, fundamentally, it's about a lifetime perspective, um, and it tends to prioritise things, um, sort of primary and community care for children and working age adults with more early stage diseases and risk factors. Whereas equity concern for current severity of illness, you know, that those who are currently ill, tends to prioritise more emergency and, and acute hospital care for older uh, citizens with late stage disease. Not always, but that's the sort of general thrust. So they're quite different in the, in the, in the sort of groups in society that tend to get prioritised. Um, and just to give an example of how these things can conflict, imagine, would you prioritise a new drug for late stage skin cancer? or um, screening for maternal depression. Imagine they're equally cost effective. They're the same in every other respect, just in terms of these two equity principles. Well, obviously, if you're concerned about current severity of illness, you're going to prioritise the late stage skin cancer treatment because, you know, the, these patients have got very short life expectancy. So on sort of end of life grounds or in, in Australia, I know that the, the PBAC committee has a rule of rescue concern, which looks at just just the um, you know, the end of life, the, uh, the short life expectancy remaining, and that would get prioritised. But on the other hand, if you're interested in health inequality, it's the opposite. You, you would actually prioritise maternal screening because babies with depressed mothers can expect below average lifetime health and social status. And most skin cancer deaths occur, um, you know, in, in quite elderly ages among people who have above average lifetime health and social status. So there we are. The, in, the, in this case, these two legitimate equity principles come apart and, and point in very different directions and we just have to be aware of that and kind of you know use different bits of evidence different sets of evidence and analytical tools to analyze these two criteria I mean I, I think it probably be a mistake to mush these two things up in one all-purpose index well it'd be, you know better to sort of disentangle these two concerns analyze severity of illness separately from health inequality and then you could recombine it if you like but it's important to keep them separate rather than confuse the two ideas in your head because they really are quite different 
concerns. OK, so when and by whom could health inequality information be used? Well, obviously, the main uh, users are going to be the payers, um, usually public sector payers. Um, and when, when they're making decisions about reimbursement and, um, and delivery. Uh, now, this is information that's potentially useful for any kind of technology. It's relevant to new as well as existing technologies. And it's relevant to curative technologies as well as preventive and public health uh, interventions. And it's potentially relevant to sort of yes, no decisions about coverage and price negotiations about new um, no technologies, as well as about uh, decisions about um, the delivery uh, and co-payments and so on. Um, and, you know, as payers get interested in this and start using information about health inequality, so industry will also get interested and will need to think about these issues uh, at the R&D stage and, and at the pricing and market access stage. Um, and just as an example, in my own country, NICE um, has recently given guidance um, on uh, Crizanlizumab for preventing sickle cell crisis and sickle cell disease. And in that guidance, they explicitly said that health inequalities were considered in the decision, both on the delivery side. So there's some text there about how they wanted to make sure that this um, medication is available um, to patients who can't make it into hospital easily. But also on the yes, no coverage decision, they're explicitly saying that because sickle cell is mostly seen in, in minority ethnic populations, um, who have worse health, health outcomes, um, the committee said it would consider um, those issues in its decision making. So it's not, it's, not, it's not actually saying that it's made a really big trade off here between cost effectiveness and health inequality, but it's pretty well pointing in the direction that this was an important consideration. And it does say that this technology was, was um, above the usual customer practice, £30,000 per quality. Um, level. And so there's there's a sign here that NICE may be starting explicitly to take into account health inequalities information uh, or uh, ideas in its decision making. Although, to be really clear, they did not use evidence about the health inequality impact. They did not use distributional cost effectiveness analysis in this case, and nor could they have, because it's not part, you know, legally, it's not part of their process documents and guidance documents so that you know they can't take into account information that's not um, um, under their methods guidance process. Anyway, so that's an example of how things are shifting and how some payers around the world are really starting to get you know seriously interested in health inequality uh, in their decision making. Um, now, how uh, uh, you know how could this be used? Uh, a, 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 a different in, in different ways. How could diff, what different kinds of information could be used at different stages of decision making? Well, I've got a little sort of classification system here uh, about four different types of information that can be used. Uh, and you know, in each case, the information can be used sort of sometimes, or it can be used you know, always. Um, it can the information can be based on evidence and analysis, or it can be based on expert opinion, and the information can be based on specific inequality measures or generic inequality measures. Um, and so, for example, here are the four types of uh, information. There's the pre, number one is the pre-decision health inequality. You can measure the baseline health inequality, um, you know, by various social uh, disadvantaged characteristics. The second uh, thing is that you can measure the impacts of your intervention on inequality and health. Um, the distribution of health benefits, uh, which depends on differences in the eligible population, the uptake of the intervention, the health effects of the intervention, and the health opportunity costs uh, of, of spending money on this intervention and, and not on other things. We're taking money away from other, other health beneficial things. Third, there's the trade offs. Okay, so you, you can measure the distributional effects, but what about the trade offs? Are there trade offs between reducing health inequalities and improving total health? And if there are, how do we analyze those? And the fourth thing is, what about the conflicts? I've already given an example of a, of a potential conflict. There's potential conflicts between prioritizing more severely ill patients and reducing health inequalities. Well, let's think about those trade-offs. Can we analyze those trade-offs? Think about um, um, which of those criteria 
and more important and are, are there conflicts between them. What information is actually currently used? Well, very little around the world on, on any of these four aspects. So pre-decision health inequalities are sometimes measured and presented to decision makers, but rarely using the generic metrics. It's almost always disease specific kind of measures. Um, intervention impacts, again, very rarely used. Particularly rare is evidence and analysis about impacts on health inequalities. Um, in my own country, NICE is starting to use DCA to inform public health guidance development, but it's not uh, doing that for technology appraisal as yet, at least. Um, in some countries, that you know, there are certain, there are sort of multi-criteria decision analysis processes which sort of formalise expert opinion about these things. But you know, what an expert thinks the health inequality impact will be is not necessarily what the health inequality impact will actually be, right? You need to do a little bit of analysis because it's quite complicated. As I'll show you later, there are four stages in the staircase of health inequality impact and things can move in different directions in unexpected ways at different stages. So it's not always, it's sometimes counterintuitive, the impact of things in health inequality. Um, and experts have got all sorts of biases, as we know. Um, third is the equity efficiency trade-offs. Again, sometimes expert opinion is used here, but rarely, rarely is there any, you know, evidence and analysis. And finally, equity-equity conflicts. Well, you know, mostly people don't even understand the concepts that, there, that these two things conflict, that severity conflicts with health inequality. You know, that's a light bulb moment for most people. So, so you know, it's not analysed. Those conflicts are not they're not, they're not even understood, let alone analysed, those conflicts. So it's a, it's a bit of a feeble position, to be quite honest, compared with the fantastic apparatus of evidence and analysis that, that exists around effectiveness and cost effectiveness. There's an incredible uh, infrastructure of data generation and expertise analysing these things and presenting information to decision makers. The expertise and the evidence presented about health inequality impacts is, is, is weak, you know, very weak. So there's a lot more to do in this area. There's then, you know, the next decades, I'm sure there'll be there'll be progress on this. Um, OK, so I'm now going to talk about some basic concepts uh, of distribution or cost effectiveness analysis. So here's the key diagram, which is the equity efficiency impact plane. Um, on the vertical axis, you've got standard cost effectiveness or total population impact. Uh, but then the missing, the invisible y-axis is the impact on health inequality. Um, so, you know, you can you can imagine an intervention that's cost effective, right? We like it. Um, it's in the top quadrant, the, the, the top half of the diagram. But um, if it's in this win-lose quadrant, it means it's harming health inequality, it's actually increasing health inequality. Um, or it could be in this quadrant here, not cost effective, but reducing health inequality. So that's a lose win scenario. And then you've got a trade off. Um, or of course, it could be lose lose, it could be both bad for health inequality and um, not cost effective in the lose lose quadrant. So you've got these four quadrants. And it would be nice if decision makers had some sort of clue which quadrant they were in. That would be a good start. At the moment, they often don't. Uh, and then if you're in a trade, if you're in a win-win quadrant, fine, go ahead and recommend it probably, right? But if you're in a trade-off qu quadrant, oh dear, what are we going to do? We have, a tra we have a problem. We need to think about these trade-offs and analyse them. And to do that, we need to use what we call the uh, health inequality aversion parameter. We need some normative judgments about how you make these trade-offs. And you can get evidence from the public about these things or from decision makers. You, know, you can think about it as a decision maker yourself. So here's the sort of questions that we use to elicit these uh, health inequality aversion parameters. And there's all sorts of other questions. This is an example. Um, and I'm not going to go through it in any detail. But basically, the idea is to elicit your views about trade offs between improving total health and reducing health inequality. So you've got program A versus program B. Program, program A um, gives additional good healthy years of life to a more advantaged group, in this case, the richest fifth of people, uh, um, where, um, and, um, whereas Programme B gives more healthy years to the, 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 the more socially disadvantaged group, in this case, the poorest fifth of people. So, you know, here the trade-off is that the richest fifth gets seven and the poorest fifth get three, 
in, in program A, but the more equitable health inequality reducing program B does the reverse, it give, but it only gives six healthy years to the poorest fifth um, uh, and three to the richest. And so the total gain in program B is only nine healthy years. So as you can see, there's a sort of trade off there. You, you know, you only get nine years in total from program B, but it's more fairly just distributed. So you've got the trade off and you know you, you can you can make a judgment and say well i prefer this or that program you know let's say you prefer program b well then you can now ask further questions and, and toughen it up and you gradually reduce this six you reduce it to five and four and so on so you you reach a point of trade-off sort of, indif sort of indifference where you're not sure which program is best and at that point that reveals how much you, you're concerned about reducing health inequality versus in, uh, increasing total health um, and so when we do that, we, 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 we've done this in the UK and it's being done across um, the world in various countries now, including Australia, I believe. I, I believe there's an abstract in, in this very conference about this. So, uh, um, um, I'm actually disappointed I won't be able to attend that because I'm quite excited about, about these findings. Um, just the wrong time zone for me. Um, but basically, um, we found quite a strong aversion to health inequality among the UK population. It'll be very interesting to see whether that's carried across in, in, in Australia. Okay, now, um, how do we design a distributional analysis? Well, there's various elements of an analysis and you don't have to do all of them, um, but you know, here they all are. You can pick and mix and choose which elements are useful for your decision-making context. So the main elements are in, in the simulating distributions um, box. So there's the baseline distribution of, of quality adjusted life expectancy at birth, or, or, or um, and then there's the benefit side, um, who, you know, who gains, and then there's the opportunity cost side, who, who loses, who bears the costs, the health costs of, of, of an intervention, and there's the, and then finally you put those things together and you re, and you and you calculate the final distribution, and then you compare the baseline to the final, and, and you can calculate various inequality metrics, and that's you know you can either just eyeball it and say well you know this is what I think. Um, you know, based on looking at the distribution, or you can do various evaluations of, of equity. You can do dominance tests. You can use indices of inequality and weighting. And, and, you know, there's various things you can do to to uh, sort of evaluate trade-offs. And crucially, you know, I've been talking about health as the main metric here, the main sort of outcome. But of course, you might be interested in other aspects. You know, simply the delivery of services, the utilization of services, and you might be interested in financial protection. Um, and I know in Australia, you've got quite high out of pocket. Well, for a high income country, you know, I think I've heard something like 18% out of pocket cost in Australia. And so, you know, you might in that context be interested in, um, in you know, catastrophic health expenditure effects of some of these decisions. Uh, and in which case you would move to a thing called extended cost effectiveness analysis, where you also take into account the distribution of financial protection as well as the distribution of, of health. Um, I'll leave that open as, as, a, as a discussion point, because uh, sometimes these things move in, in different directions. OK, so that's that's the, the basic elements. Um, and whatever elements you, 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 you choose to put in, it, it's probable that you want going to be interested in the distribution of effects, the benefits. You know, that, that's really central to this. And to, to analyse that properly, you really need to look at these four uh, stages uh, in the staircase of, of inequality impact, um, which may move in different directions. So, in, in the eligible population stage, you know, different diseases and conditions have different prevalence uh, among the population by your social groups. So, you know, d diseases may be more prevalent among more socially disadvantaged groups often, uh, but that varies by disease. Then there's the uptake, and again, it may be that more socially disadvantaged people are less likely to take up a particular intervention. They have less good access to it, um, more barriers to um, taking up care, and so on and so forth. Um, there may be also social differences by effectiveness. You know, once you receive the intervention, how effective is it? Are there competing risks and comorbidities that change the pattern of effects for different groups? And finally, there may be different opportunity costs by social group. If you take money away from a service in order to fund something, uh, who, who, you know, how, how large are the um, losses to different groups? And that will depend where the money's coming from, crucially, whether it's from a health 
service or whether it's from other public expenditure or indeed from private expenditure. Uh, so these things need to be thought about. Um, and the differences may vary at different stages uh, in, in the um, staircase of inequality. And therefore, the overall impact on health inequality may not be immediately obvious, especially if you know if things are moving different directions and on different steps of the pathway. And, you, and it varies, you have to think about these things. Okay, so that's the staircase of inequality being useful. Okay, so quick and simple DCA. I just want to talk a little bit about that because the, the analysis I've just talked about, you know, was quite involved at different stages of the staircase. Quite a lot of modelling was done. So now, can we do it quicker and simpler? Answer: Yes, we can. We, I mean, we've created a little web-based tool for use in England, uh, and you know that can spit out results pretty quickly with a few assumptions. But then the time is taken in verifying those assumptions and doing sensitivity analysis and thinking, well, okay, do we need to do more? Do we, you know, do we need a proper full distributional analysis with full underpinning modeling or can we get away with just our simplified one and it depends well obviously it depends on how important uh, how you know the, the 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 decision is how 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 large and positive or negative the impact is and what the uncertainties are and, and one has to think through that and this tool kind of helps you think through the, those uncertainties um so as I was saying, yeah, so basically there we are. Simplified DCA does not do the detailed underpinning modeling, but it gives you a sort of basic analysis. You know, once you've done a cost effectiveness, a standard cost effectiveness analysis, then you can layer on top of it this, this simplified distributional analysis. And here's an example I've, I've just used, I've spat out these numbers, hypothetical numbers using the tool. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm imagining a convenient new diabetes medication for patients with poorly controlled blood sugar levels. And I'm imagining that such patients well, but, you know, because of the prevalence of, of diabetes being higher in disadvantaged people, you know, it's almost certain that this would tend to reduce health inequality, but it would benefit or deprive patients more. But imagine it's not cost effective at the normal kind of range. Then we're in this blob here. We're in this in, the, in this um, sort of lose win quadrant. It's not cost effective, but it is reducing health inequality. Um, you know, in this analysis we're measuring the health inequality impact in terms of qualies um it's basically it's the the change in the burden of health inequality um i won't go into all the details of how you there's different ways of calculating the burden of health inequality but it's all it's all kind of in, in the handbook forgive me that's a hand literally a hand waving um, way of describing it but it, 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 it yeah i we're running out of time um okay so um or underneath this 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 tool it spits out the distribution of prevalence so here we can see that you know imd1 is the more disadvantaged populations they're the ones who benefit more from from this intervention and you end up with this distribution of benefits this distribution of health losses we're assuming an equal distribution of losses across the social spectrum and then finally you end up with this distribution of net health benefits now you'll see that the health losses are actually bigger than the health gains that's just a, a quirk of how things work um, uh, in cost effectiveness analysis. The decision threshold that we that, that payers use for new technologies tends to be higher than the kind of marginal productivity uh, of resources. So there's this difference between the supply side threshold, if you like, and the demand side threshold. And again, I'm not going to go into all that, but basically, um, in a sense, payers around the world, you could say they're paying too much for new medicines. Or you could say, well, basically, the, the better way to put it would be they're paying a premium for innovation. They're, they're paying extra for new technologies compared with old ones uh, in terms of the health gain uh, because they're valuing the new technologies more in, for, for various reasons. And that's perfectly legitimate. That's a political process. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, so, so you end up with these kinds of pictures. It's, it's often the case that the health losses uh, are bigger when you're evaluating new technologies. So when you're evaluating public health policies and all existing technologies, the picture could, could look quite different. Okay, so that's an example of how you might use these kinds of simplified tools. And then you can spit out lots of different, you can, you know, if you do quick and simple analysis, you can spit out lots of different um, distributional uh, analyses for lots of technologies. And this is an example of some colleagues uh, who's, who did this for a whole bunch of public health interventions in the equity, plotting the results in the equity impact plane. Here's an example for 
uh, lots of um, technology appraisals in the equity impact plane. And as you'll see, it tends to be um, in the win-win quadrant, but there are some in, in, in the other in the trade-off quadrants there. Um, and obviously decision makers, you know, in a way you only have to worry if you're in a trade-off quadrant. If you're in the win-win quadrant, fine, you don't have a, don't have a equity, you know, the, the health and quality information doesn't, doesn't change your decision or doesn't make you modify anything. But if you're in a trade-off quadrant, then you might want to, um, you know, alter your decision or alter your delivery uh, guidance. Okay, so basically that's it. Um, and I'm just going to finish now with some further readings that I hope would be useful for you. And I hope you have a really good discussion about all these issues. I hope, hope I've provoked some thoughts for you. So here's the handbook, um, which is um, available uh, in all good bookshops. Well, it's actually not, it's available online, probably easiest to buy online. And there's a discount. If you, if you go to this uh, uh, website down the bottom there, you can get a discount on it. Um, and here are some useful readings, uh, including a systematic review of, of distribution analysis that was recently done by my colleague Anton, who is also a um, co-convener of the ISPOR Special Interest Group on Equities, which I very much encourage you all to join. So thanks so much um, for listening. And as I say, I hope you have a great discussion and, um, you know, glad that you're interested in, in, these, in these important issues. OK, thanks so much. All right, so that was the present. Okay, so that was the presentation of um, Professor Richard Cookson um, regarding distribution of cost effectiveness analysis and how it may be useful in addressing inequity issues, particularly in um, economic analysis. And to further contextualize um, that presentation, this um, new set of techniques that are being used to incorporate equity in the analysis, economic analysis. We will have a discussion. So our discussant will be Professor Stephen Yan. Steve, Steve, Steve is the head of health economics and process evaluation program and program and co-director of the health system science at the George Institute for Global Health and conjoint professor at the University of New South Wales. He has previously held posts at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the Center for Health Economics Research and Evaluations in Sydney. He has over 25 years of experience in health economics, has published more than 300 articles, and has worked closely with various governments of different levels, both in Australia and overseas, with, even with international agencies such as the WHO and the industry. His areas of expertise are economic evaluation, health financing, health sector priority setting, and indigenous and global health issues and the economics of chronic disease. So let, also, let us all welcome Professor Stephen Yan to discuss the um, to contextualize um, what was presented by Professor Cookson. So, Steve. Thanks, Paul. Um, I, I have some slides, so um, I'll just share them on screen. Um, before I do so, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on, um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the elders past, present, and emerging, and if there are any Aboriginal people uh, on the call today. So um, as Paul said, um, my role is just to really sort of discuss some of the issues that have arisen from uh, Richard's uh, excellent presentation of uh, distributional cost effectiveness analysis. Um, a first point I'd like to make is that, you know, this idea of incorporating equity into economic evaluation has been around for a long time, um, not just in, in the health economics literature, but, but it, it has a long history in the economics literature. And, just some examples of, of um, studies that have been done through the years that have looked at this issue, um, particularly in relation to cost benefit analysis. Um, uh, I mean, everybody's, I mean, I think probably from day one, people recognize that uh, once you do do cost uh, benefit analysis, that there are strong equity implications of, of, of doing so. So um, not encountering, not uh, including equity into your analysis doesn't mean that it's equity neutral. Um, there are strong value judgments in any form of economic evaluation. And the value judgments associated with cost benefit analysis are particularly strong if you're using things like uh, willingness to pay or human capital to measure, uh, to measure, um, to measure the benefits. And, and, and these are issues that have been uh, well recognized and, and uh, commentators have highlighted 
the throughout the years. In health economics, again, uh, we've uh, had a number of commentators, um, including uh, uh, yes, uh, in Steve. Yes, yes, Steve, your presentation. Um, can you like um, put, do you want to put that into slide presentation show? Slide okay. Yep. Okay. Is that better? Um, it's not changing. Oh, is it not changing? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's changed on my screen. Um, maybe I'll stop share. Okay. Share screen. Um, PowerPoint slideshow. This one. Is that better? Um, we're um we're seeing the the notes. Oh, you're not seeing them. Uh, we are seeing the notes, like the state oh, okay. presenter view. Oh, okay. Perhaps, um, I, I given, yeah, um, look, I mean, you could just share, um, or, or, uh, I'll share what I was sharing before. I think yeah, that okay. you'll probably still see the slides from that, can't yeah. you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Can you see that? There, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so in health economics, we've we've um, had a number of commentators who over the years have um, uh, talked about equity in, in economic evaluation. Uh, most notably, uh, a guy named Alan Williams, who uh, I, I believe was uh, one of uh, Richard's professors who who explored the notion of intergenerational equity and the uh, exploration of the fair innings argument in, in economic evaluation. Um, so a lot of this debate um, so uh, in the past has talked about the, the weighting of quality, so uh, incorporating uh, equity weights into our quality measures. Oh, looks like, um, I bet it, my, oh yeah, sorry. Um, and as, as Richard mentioned, uh, there had been parallel sort of initiatives to look at uh, equity in cost effectiveness uh, recently. And um, one of the most notable is, is the uh, framework uh, called extended cost effectiveness analysis. And that um, is largely being done in low and middle income countries. And the idea there is to conduct cost effectiveness analysis of interventions, looking at the impact of those interventions on um, reductions in out-of-pocket costs and um, financial catastrophe. So for instance, if we uh, implement a, a stroke prevention program and uh, reduce cases uh, of stroke by 10%, then those um, prevented cases are also preventing potential finan uh, instances of financial catastrophe. So those people no longer have to um, incur the costs of hospitalizations, uh, and therefore we've averted certain numbers of um, catastrophic uh, cases. And so, so that's been a measure that's been used, particularly in low and middle income countries, and it's been used to inform policies around universal health coverage. So, so that's a bit of background to, to what's happening. It's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's an idea that's, that's not new, but uh, what is new uh, and what has been impressive in particular around Richard's work has been the, the cut through that he's had. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, the, the research impact and the expansion of this framework um, to uh, analyses um, across number of um, research programs. Um, I think the challenge in coming years will be to uh, increased the impact on policy. So um, what, what the example that he provided in the um, presentation was how NICE took into account equity in its consideration of a sickle cell um, um, treatment. Um, what um, they hadn't done is, is formally use an ex, uh, a distributive cost effectiveness framework in that, but um, perhaps uh, one of the goals in coming years is to is to extend its influence on, on organisations like NICE and the PBAC in Australia and various other sort of organisations to, to, to use extended cost effectiveness analysis. The other 
second point I would like to make in relation to uh, the use of extended uh, distributive uh, cost effectiveness analysis is some of the potential unintended consequences. And the rationale behind um, distributive cost effectiveness analysis is, is in a sense to, to um, as uh, Richard indicated in the first part of the lecture, is not to look at averages, but to look at the impacts in terms of costs and effects in subgroups. So, and those subgroups may be defined by um, characteristics such as socioeconomic status, income, uh, probably employment status, education, whatever. This is markers of, of social disadvantage. The problem is that um, once you do that, uh, you may actually end up with results that um, don't necessarily promote equity in the way you would want. So uh, it's, it's plausible, for instance, not likely to be always the case, but plausible that um, communities uh, that are disadvantaged may require um, more expenditure or greater costs in the delivery of interventions. For instance, they may live in sort of um, less well-served um, geographical regions. They may be uh, living in remote and rural areas, and therefore the costs of delivering those services may be higher. Likewise, the effectiveness of those interventions in those communities may be reduced because of um, uh, factors that are related to um, the disadvantage. So, uh, and, and therefore, um, things like um, adherence levels to, to uh, new treatments may be lower in disadvantaged communities. Um, uh, health ability to, um, to take on board health information. So health literacy may be, may be lower and therefore uh, impact upon the effectiveness of these interventions. So those sorts of factors may actually mean that um, interventions uh, become less cost effective in, in um, disadvantaged communities. Um, and so, so you know, passing out some of these subgroups may, um, on the face of it, uh, in many instances, um, um, uncover um, you know, findings that are uh, not necessarily pro-equitable. Um, I suppose one way to address this, and, and, and this is something that is built into distributed cost-effectiveness analysis, is, is to impose some weightings on the outcomes that um, are, are um, achieved uh, in, in different groups. And, and the, one of the points that I'd like to make there is that um, um, some of these weightings can be problematical. Um, uh, uh, the point that uh, Richard made, but didn't really go into detail, is that those weightings are generally um, values that come from the community, but um, that raises a whole range of methodological issues about how those, um, I mean, who in the community do you elicit these values from? How are they elicited? And also, whether doing those sorts of weightings are acceptable uh, in the first place. And I've got here in the slide the um, point around the Dally's experience. Uh, I don't know if you, um, you were old enough to recall, but uh, in the early 1990s, um, the WHO, when they first uh, developed the, the metric uh, known as the Disability Adjusted Life Year, which is in a sense similar to Qualys, in the sense that it, it's, a, it's an outcome measure that uh, to uh, assess the impact um, on, um, on health outcomes. So it's, it's, it's a measure of survival weighted by disability. And um, when they first developed it, um, uh, they didn't just weight by disability, but they, for different age groups, they imposed an additional weighting. So for uh, working age adults, they had a higher weighting and a lower weighting for um, children and, and adolescents and a lower weighting for people in the uh, older age groups. And their rationale behind that was that people um, in the middle, uh, the working age population um, should have a higher weight because of their instrumental role in economic um, productivity, as well as in caring for um, people in the other age groups. Um, that caused a whole lot of controversy um, and, uh, and a bit of backtracking from WHO and in the, sec the next subsequent round of, of um, uh, DALIs, they, they sort of walked back that um, um, uh, technique and um, basically applied DALIs equally across uh, age groups.
So, so there you can see that they're, they're, that applying the, these sorts of weights isn't going to be without controversy, and it is something that needs to be tested, I think, in, in the community. Some of the other issues that might arise are methodological. So if you're looking at subgroups, uh, you, you do need to think about how we design trials and in particular the inclusion criteria in the trials. Um, uh, and this is, this is a good thing. Um, the trials typically uh, include only people who are relatively easy to study. So people who are going to follow up, people who uh, don't have multimorbidity, people who um, are uh, like more likely to comply with treatment. And this often means trials give results that are unreflective of the general population and how new drugs or new treatments are going to be used in, in real practice. And so, so this may actually stimulate a, a positive movement in the design of trials to broaden out our uh, inclusion criteria. Another methodological issue in relation to trials and intervention studies is, is the power issue. So if we, we are going to be focusing on subgroups, then we're going to have to be sure that we've got enough people in those subgroups to do meaningful analyses. And that's, that's probably another positive um, um, implication of, 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 of this work is that it may encourage people to, to, um, to actively sample these, these groups uh, and achieve that uh, power, statistical power. Um, another point here um, that I'd like to raise is that um, what underpins the distributive uh, cost-effectiveness analysis is the reduction in health inequalities. I know Richard touched upon this point earlier, but, um, but it's an assumption that I think can be called into question. I don't necessarily think health systems um, underlying objective is, is to reduce health inequalities. A lot of health systems their, their primary goal is stated more around access and equity and resource allocation. And that, that sort of revolves around this whole issue around universal health coverage. Um, and these are perhaps uh, more procedural or, or, or opportunity-based um, um, objectives than, than the consequentialist uh, objective that, that Richard talked about, this, this, this idea that we need to equalize outcomes across different groups. We know from the COVID uh, epidemic that uh, different people have different preferences for health. And there are other things that people that are important in life that people value and perhaps are, are, are willing to make trade-offs with. And, and, and those preferences aren't going to be necessarily uniform across the population. And so perhaps um, this idea of health inequalities imposes a degree of uniformity in our preferences in relation to health that may not necessarily reflect community values. Finally, um, the point uh, I'd like to sort of close on is, is intergenerational equity. And I, it is something that's becoming more and more important, particularly as we get um, uh, more conscious of, of things like climate change and, uh, and, and, and how we use up our resources. And I just would like to sort of make a plug there for um, us thinking more about this issue and how we might incorporate that into our um, analyses uh, in health economics. So I'll finish there and, and I look forward to some comments. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Steve, for that excellent presentation. So, and um, discussion. Um, actually, I'm um, having work. So, in my, my background, really, before health economics, is neglected tropical diseases. So, when I learned about the methods on equity informative economic evaluation, I got really excited because I think it was very applicable. But I think your discussion was really good because it was able, we were able to identify like the challenges that it actually entails, that there will be more challenges also that um, if you consider equity. So we're happy to um, um, uh, respond to a couple of questions um, regarding um, Richard and Steve's presentation, but just to start the discussion, I guess uh, a broader question would be, um, we highlighted that there will be a lot of methodological issues, for example, like um, child design or et cetera. But I wonder like moving forward, how, how do you think would be um, this? Because in the end, like we, all, we often do economic evaluation, even HTA for decision-making. Um, so how do you think, would this be like something that decision-makers maybe in Australia or even in other countries, maybe LMICs, would it be something that would they will really consider, or this would be just be um, added complications on the current um, uh, method um, processes? Because, for example, in the Philippines, we are just like rolling out the health technology assessment. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I I agree. I think uh, the problem 
in a sense with equity is that um, it is a little bit subjective. There's no one universally agreed upon definition of equity. Um, and the problem there is that um, it is often subject to different political biases. So, so equity may be high on the agenda for certain governments of a political uh, persuasion, but then may come off the agenda when the next government comes in. I suppose the, the, the beauty of cost effectiveness in the HTA framework as it is, is it, it in, a, in a way cost effectiveness and efficiency transcends um, different shades of government. Um, it, 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 I mean, efficiency is efficiency. It's, it's, it's not something that um, people uh, can necessarily say um, uh, is, is a bad thing, right? all else being equal. Whereas equity has that sort of, um, in a sense, politically transient um, um, quality, which then means that um, it may be difficult to institutionalize into a, a policy framework like HTA, like the PBAC, because it can be become a bit of a political football. One, one, one government might come in and, and, and uh, put a high weighting on equity uh, in, in its decisions, and then the next one may decide to, um, to, to sort of um, tone down the equity emphasis. So, so I see some challenges, but uh, uh, regardless of that, I, I do think it is an important step because I think all governments do like to talk up equity and, and, and there is community um, um, sentiment behind that. So, so um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that goes. And I remember like in a previous discussion with you, Richard, you also mentioned that maybe we are now at the stage where we're in, like back then, like when qualities was introduced, like there were a lot of uncertainties on whether it will be incorporated or taken into account. And now we are actually using it all, all the time, especially in Australia. So hopefully in the future, it could be something that would be considered, so equity in performing our economic analysis. Yeah. So yeah, um, thank you very much. So I think um, we haven't seen any questions and um, we're actually already over, also over the time. So on behalf again of the organizing committee, so we would like to thank um, Steve Yan, uh, Professor Steve Yan, thank you very much again for delivering that discussion. And we hope that we, um, yeah, we, we look forward to still uh, working with you even in our future events or even as a collaborator in hopefully e equity related work. So, again, thank you very much and yeah, um, for your time and your presentation. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, at this juncture, um, we will now proceed with the presentations, with the presentations of selected. Um, um, health economics HEOR students and ECRs that we have selected from those who submitted their abstracts. And that will be facilitated by Elena Keller, my colleague. So she will chair the next session. So again, thank you very much for listening to that keynote. And also to address, I think we had some challenges when it comes to like accessing the password um, in the calendar invite. So we, um, on behalf of the team, I apologize um, with that um, um, technical issue. But um, rest assured that all of the sessions are recorded and will be shared to all, um, to almost um, uh, to all of those uh, almost 100 people who registered for this event. Okay, so I'm turning this over to Elena. Elena, thank you, Paul. Um, we actually still have one or two minutes, so um, let's just have a quick break and then we'll start with the student research spotlight session in about two minutes. Um, and I think we can also stop the recording for this session now. And then I'll just restart it um, for the next session. <laughs>